Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I'm Dan, and this is the Having Initiative podcast. Today's episode features my first guest, Ron Wilkins. New York City-based musician Ron Wilkins has been performing on tenor and bass trombones, euphonium, tuba, bass trumpet, and vocals for over 40 years. He has performed at the highest levels touring around the world with his own groups as well as premier artists. Ron is a member of the Birdland Big Band, Dizzy Gillespie All-Star Big Band, and runs his own New York City Big Band alongside trombonist Rebecca Patterson, which features their writing and includes some of New York City's premier musicians. Ron is a Shires trombone artist and plays Giddings mouthpieces. He has worked with Ivan Giddings to create his own signature line of mouthpieces. For his full bio, I recommend checking out www.ronwilkins.net. And with that, here's my interview with Ron Wilkins. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start this off with a little story, and I'll see if you remember. So for those listening, I was in middle school and high school from fall 2000 to spring 2007. And I was playing this instrument called the euphonium. I'll provide pictures later for everyone listening. And in sixth grade, I heard a performance that you did. And as a beginner, it was like, that seems impossibly good, insurmountable. I don't understand it at all. And then as I got better at, at playing music, it only increased my appreciation for your abilities because now I, you know what's going on behind the scenes and it still was that much impressive. So uh, about the time I was in sophomore year of high school, I was with a teacher that I didn't feel had a passion for my instrument specifically. Sure. And m my instrument, there's this hard to find a teacher that that is their primary normally they play something else such as trombone or bass sure. trombone. Mm -hmm. so uh, i had heard you and uh, one of my buddies was taking from you and so i asked you hey would you like to take on another student and you said sure and you started going over your rates and what to expect from teaching and whatnot and it sounded good and then at the end you said something along the lines of just so you know sir if you i feel that you're not trying or you're not using what i'm giving you i'm going to stop teaching you if you've paid ahead of time i'm going to give you a refund but i won't teach you anymore and that moment right there taught me this is the teacher that i want you remember that oh, i do remember that you <laughs> awesome. were the only one i gave that spiel to by the way yeah yeah i i, I figured as, as part of the as part of the regular routine just to make sure that i kind of covered myself but yeah that uh, apparently had quite the impact yeah. And we yeah. worked together for about two and a half years. You helped yep. me make state on my instrument twice. Yep. Uh, and the lessons learned specifically with you about, you know, holding yourself to a high standard and lots of so many other things. All of those things have benefited me since I've stopped playing my instrument when I, I've stopped pretty much in high school. So, right. yeah, I'm very grateful for our time together. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, I would, I would, you know, these days now that we're both on the other side of, of that time period, uh, you know, if you ever get the urge to want to pick up a euphonium again, I know some people. Ooh, awesome. I will elaborate Seriously. on that. Yeah, I will elaborate on that in a little bit, though. But Please, yes, I definitely appreciate the offer. So could you quickly, because I, I met you in 2007 and I had heard a couple of things, like you were in the military yeah. and you played there for a while. Can you give us a quick overview of your history as a musician like when did you first play the trombone i don't think i've ever heard that yeah um i first started on trombone back in sixth grade and that wasn't my first choice of instrument uh, my first choice was actually drums but my middle school band i went to kruger middle school in san antonio yeah i was a, i was a kruger falcon wow <laughs> yes the black and gold call call so uh, the band director said, okay, you, what do you want to play? And, you know, and I'm like, I want to play drums. I'm going to be great. I figured I'd be a good drummer. You know, I, I kind of bashed around on a toy drum set for a while and figured I had some chops. Yeah. And uh, he gave me this rhythm test that there was no way at that age and that time with no study I could do. So I tried to do it anyway. It looked really bad. You know, had to deal with the hurt and pain. Yeah. Uh, and then he said, you know what? I think, you know, we should try some other instruments. And uh, let's give you a shout on something else. What he told me years later was that he, you know, he already had like way too many drummer and percussionist types kids coming through and he needed low brass, mm -hmm. trombone in particular. 
So he tries me on a couple of brass instruments. I don't remember what they were at the time because I was still like traumatized from not having succeeded in my life's dream of being a drummer. Yeah. And um, ended up on here. If this fits on your face, buzz on this, do this. So I did that and got us that vibration. Then he put the horn on my face and he said, here, just, he said, just play a note. Let me see if you can get a sound out of it. And I, that, by that time, I was pretty you know, frustrated with not having achieved my dream of drumming. Yeah. So I just blew. And I got this really big, loud note out of it. And he just went, whoa, ah, I think we found your instrument. And all of a sudden, I'm like, <laughs> so I had to go back home and tell my folks I'm not, I didn't do good on drums. And uh, He gave me this instead as a trombone. Well, my dad, being kind of a jazz head and such, knew a little bit about trombone just from the, the cats he listened to, like J, maybe J.J. Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, he was encouraging, supportive. My mom was like, well, if you're going to play the instrument, we have to give you lessons. Yeah. So from there, from sixth grade into then later high school at Roosevelt High School, uh, I went on, made all region. I was also, uh, by the time I got into my junior year, uh, I had taken the chops that I developed as a, as a kid singing in church since age five and mm -hmm. joined the choir. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was also doing singing in junior and then senior choir. And that's where the choir director found out, asked me a question about if I could hear certain things in music. And I said, yeah, I can hear these notes. I, what's up? And she's like, I think you have perfect pitch. I never heard about that before. So, you know, I was kind of curious about it. Being a 15 or 16 year old kid who's trying to go ahead and always get a little, a little more street cred and such, it's like, yeah, I, I got perfect pitch. I can hear music. Whoa. You know, that and that and back in the day, 10 cents would get me maybe a cup of coffee. Nowadays, it's like 250. Yeah. So I just went ahead and said, okay. Um, after I'd gotten through and I started really finding my passion on the music instrument, and in fact, one thing also, because my older brother was a saxophonist mm. and uh, still plays a little bit now. He's actually an ordained minister now. Oh, wow. And uh, but he and I used to play at our church when we were kids, like when we were like early teens and such, uh, and, and playing along with the church a pianist and accompanying on certain hymns and such in the tradition of this other duo of gentlemen who used to go and tour around the Texas and the Southeast uh, with this singer named Lillian Sutton Taylor. Ms. Taylor was known as the songbird of the South and she always had her accompanist with her, but she also brought along these two cats who could play saxophone and trombone. Their names were Ellis and Dixon. So eventually it came down to this tradition coming from my church to where all of a sudden the members of the church would see my older brother as the Deacon Ellis, who was the saxophonist, and then, of course, Dixon, who was playing trombone. And uh, I never found out what happened to them. I, I should research that now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that along with being in middle school and high school band kind of helped to start fashioning my ears and getting my, my sense of understanding music. And I started finding out that I could play pretty good. There are things I still couldn't figure out on trombone, but I felt like I had enough talent and ability to where I wanted to at least pursue it, in, you know, as a possible vocation, avocation. So I, I ended up um, going to a year at San Antonio College and then got a scholarship and attended the uh, University of North Texas. Mm -hmm. so it's where I did uh, the brunt of my undergrad studies. Yep. And um, learned a lot, learned a lot from there. After, uh, and after spending time there for about four years, I actually uh, auditioned for and was selected to be a member of this college all-star jazz big band led by uh, the great jazz trumpeter and educator Clark Terry, who was wow. formerly a soloist with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. Oh, wow. Ones. He yeah. also found out he was Miles Davis's trumpet teacher, along with Quincy Jones's trumpet teacher. Big time. Big time. <laughs> yeah. Big time. So I'm a hanger with these cats from all over the country, and a few from North Texas, along with me. And we did a tour for about five or five and a half months. Uh, after we came off from the tour, I came back that summer to North Texas, and... Uh, immediately had more chops going and such but uh was you know more so focused towards finishing my degree so i had to i turned down a spot uh from the director of the one o'clock lab band leon breeden who pretty much said after i came off the road and heard me play he's like you're playing in the top jazz band here congratulations this is your audition and i said i'm sorry i can't do it sir i've got to finish my degree i've got a course that meets right at that same time and mm. my parents taught me it was more important to get my education yeah so what she said you're turning me down so you can get your education. And I said, yeah. And he's like, wow. He says, yeah. that's, that's really impressive. Yeah. And seriously, he said, he said, I can't fault you for that. I mean, he's like, 
If there was any other stupid reason, I've heard hundreds of them from kids, but you turned down the one o'clock lab band, which is now one of the most prestigious college university jazz ensembles in the world. Yeah. Not to mention the music program. So I could go ahead and finish my undergraduate degree because there was a class that met at the same time and I couldn't do both. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I still kept that, that focus with me, uh, but I still continued on, you know, to finish the degree. Uh, and then um, spent uh, about 10 years in the uh, United States Air Force Band, the Band of the West at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Mm, wow. So I, I spent um, just about 10 years there and then was able to go ahead and uh, finish up my time from that. And then when I got out, um, I started going right into teaching, uh, doing some stuff at first. Um, at St. Mary's University in San Antonio as a private instru- as a college instructor, mm-hmm. college teacher, but then also, uh, you know, doing lots of private lessons and teaching lots of students in and around the San Antonio area, which, yeah. which I pretty much did from whew, 19, I would say, 1989 wow. to about 2012. Wow, 89 I, was... I taught 80. hundreds of kids. Yeah, 89 was when, when I was born. <laughs> Sorry yeah. to date myself. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, so I was I was uh, into the whole teaching thing there and yet still playing with bands in and around San Antonio, eventually in Austin. Um, and started doing, once I got out of the Air Force band, I started doing a lot more Broadway show work, touring shows coming through town. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I ended up playing over at the Majestic Theater for most of them because I became a member of the Musicians Union figuring that at least being a union member would allow me at least better benefits and a little bit more protection against certain gigs or contractors and such. Yeah. Uh, and to a point it helped, but to another point it really didn't help as much because Texas is a right to work state. It's not a big union state. Mm. Um, so there are years where I was supposed to have gotten union pension, but it never really fully came through because, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, there are a few reasons on that. Yeah. Uh, I found, I did some research on this, and even when I, the times where I tried to go ahead and do that, it would turn out where I had to pay myself to go mm. ahead and at least get pension working. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes it gets crazy. I, I, these days, I'm in a much better position. I'm, yeah. You know, I'm a member of the local 802 union up here in New York, and, uh, you know, I got pension. I got, I got benefits. I got a great paying job, and I'm playing on Broadway with a, a Pretty amazing show. It's the revival of Funny Girl, which uh, the last time it was on Broadway was 58 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. it's the story of Fanny Bryce, a uh, vaudeville, uh, vaudeville time or period based comedian, uh, first uh, woman of her day to become like a, a nationally, if not internationally known uh, entertainer and star. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's, there's some interesting stories about that. The bigger thing is, is that with Broadway, uh, when the, when the musical was brought together and put on Broadway, they needed a lead to play the role of Fanny Bryce. So it turns out that this young aspiring teenage singer named Barbara Streisand did the audition (laughs) and, uh, won the spot and pretty much made history from there. Um, so with us doing this, uh, 2022 recreation, uh, we've got Beanie Feldstein, who's mm. a very fine actress and singer, yeah. uh, who's been playing the role of Fanny Bryce, but she's going to be leaving the show by the end of July, and they're going to oh. be bringing in this actress who used to be on Glee, named Leah Michelle. Oh. If you remember that series. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of stuff going on nowadays because we have a lot more access to information courtesy of social media. Yeah. So I, I, I hear a ton of things. The bigger thing on my end is that at this point in time right now, whether it's going to be uh, Beanie still for a little while and then Leah Michelle coming in, or the understudy for the show, who names Julie Benko, who's phenomenal. She's a fantastic singer, great yeah. actress, uh, and just really nice. I mean, they're all nice. Uh, they're all good, pretty much good folks, and some of the most talented people I've ever encountered working on a Broadway show. Uh, Jane Lynch, who was mm. also in Glee, among yeah. others, and uh, currently is like the one of the host for the show, The Weakest Link. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, she's all, she comes on, she plays Fanny Bryce's mom on the show. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of comedy and there's humor, there's a, there's a love story, there's, there's tragedy and there's triumph and uh, all those things that make Broadway special. Mm-hmm. 
And, and, I mean, and it's a huge story and it's a great soundtrack. Yeah. Um, we, we are dealing with uh, the, the orchestra being what it usually was when it first started around maybe a 30 piece or 32 piece orchestra with strings, mm -hmm. brass, woodwinds, percussion to now a, I believe it's like a 14 piece orchestra with uh, the conductor and the assistant conductor on synthesizers. With oh. Presets. And then we have uh, you know, violin, the, uh, actually the second violinist also plays and doubles on viola, cellist, and we have a bassist, drummer, percussionist, uh, two trumpets, horn, and one trombone. And uh, it's mm. it's a heck of a show. Okay. It's a heck That's of a show. The soundtrack's pretty, it's, it's pretty cool. It's kind of neat to be a part of something like this that has so much history on it. And so far, so good. I'm, I'm knocking on the fall wood on my desk here. <laughs> That uh, we're we're still going. I mean, you know, the 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 show's getting good reviews. It's getting good numbers, and yeah. uh, we keep plugging away. There's other shows around us that are, are that have been going forever. Like, of course, Phantom, Phantom yeah. Opera, uh, yeah. Lion King, Wicked, uh, Aladdin's been going for a few years now as well. Uh, uh, they all got shut down, but they came back. Uh, other shows as well, like uh, Music Man, featuring Hugh Jackman. Oh. <laughs> um, is is going on Broadway right now, and, and I mean, there's a fair share of, of musicals that are running right now, even though we're, we're still dealing with this whole thing with COVID, and the latest variant doesn't make it any easier. Yeah. Well. But um, you know, anyway, that's kind of the short encapsulated version. Yeah, yeah. That that's and worth. There's a lot of stuff I didn't even know in that. So, congratulations on your current position and Thank success. You. Thank you. It's a, <laughs> it's it's paid a lot of dues to get here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can only imagine. And yeah. a funny story is that when I was in sixth grade and going in, I wanted to be a drummer, too. And really? The, yeah, the <laughs> summer the summer leading up, because my mom had played a little, they, like, had me on the drum pad and would do, you know, basic rhythm exercise. And I'm like, I don't like these. These aren't good. They're like, well, this is what you need to be. To, this is what you need to do to be a drummer. I'm like, yeah, whatever. And so when I went in an audition, they're like, we don't want you on drums. We want you in low brass. Oh. And at the, at the wow. time, we want you to play a uh, baritone. I'm like, what's that? And that has been the story of my life. And then moving on to euphonium, it's like, what is that? It's like, exactly. But uh, <laughs> I, I, lo I love the instrument. And uh, on another note, in high school, knowing how that percussion section was, I'm, I'm glad I didn't. I wouldn't have mixed well with those personalities. Uh, yeah, I can't yeah. remember. I can't remember some of the crew that was back there. Back in the day, live from William Churchill. Yeah. Holy smoke. Wow. Well, look at us now. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. So, Man. and in small world, when with all of everyone on Broadway and who you, you know, uh, like the that you were with the Duke Ellington or part of the Duke Ellington. So, yeah, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I've, um, I've, I've had some fabulous experiences in my life so far. And yeah. uh, the hits just keep on coming. Awesome. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm doing not just the, the Broadway work. That's great. But I also play regularly on Fridays with the Birdland Big Band, the Birdland Jazz Club, which is one of the oldest and more reputable jazz clubs in the world. Uh, wow. Along with also playing uh, as a member of the now Grammy Award winning, uh, by way of a composition, 8-Bit uh, Big Band, led by Charlie Rose. Mm which is a really phenomenal big band that does a lot of uh, video game music. Oh. It's been reorchestrated and scored for big band with strings. Yeah. It's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. With, also with, with guest artists coming in too, which is just great. Uh, I've done a couple of performances live with these guys over at Sony Hall here in New York. Uh, but they're going to be going out and doing some performances as well this fall out in Cali and then back up in Boston at Berkeley. Uh, Charlie Rosen, um, the leader of the band himself, um, he's like a wonderkin, man. The guy's not even 30 years old yet, but he's already won Grammys for uh, orchestrations for Broadway shows. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, and, and now a Grammy for a co-composition that he and this other guy wrote uh, for the 8-Bit Big Band. Now, he's oh. actually won, I'm sorry, I said Grammys, he won Emmys for oh, his work. Uh, yeah. for his work uh, oh, I'm All right, which award show am I talking about? From the Broadway, <laughs> it's Tony's. Emmys yeah. is TV, oh. Oscars is movies, Grammys is So he's won a Grammy, he's won a Tony. Wow. Already. He's on his way to what we call the EGOT. You know, yeah. Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. Thing. Yeah. 
<laughs> I have no doubt he could do it. The guy plays like 70 different instruments and he's, he's just <laughs> a beast. Great writer as well as singer, as well as composer, arranger. So I, I play with him along with some of the other New York's other finest players. And then I also play along with uh, uh, some of the best jazz guys in New York City, around, not from around the world, in the Tizzy Gillespie All-Star Big Band. Um, I work regularly with them. And then I also do some hits with a long-established big band here that was uh, based off of the music of such great jazz musicians and band leaders like Illinois Jaquette, uh, called the Harlem Renaissance Orchestra. And then on top of that, I've also done chamber brass works. I've played with orchestras here. I've also done, uh, yes, I mean, project after project after project. A lot of recording sessions. Yeah. Um, the next thing for me is uh, finally, and I've been threatening to do this for years, but finally released my book of bass from bone jazz etudes based on the blues and all 12 blues. Wow. That's the next thing I'm looking at uh, down the road. I'm currently endorsed. Uh, I'm a Shires trombone artist. They make the greatest trombones I've ever played. Wow. Along with Giddings mouthpieces, uh, Ivan Giddings, I think is a bit of a wizard. The way he works with stainless steel and creates brass mouthpieces, the mouthpieces for brass instruments. Um, the, I mean, I, I've got a lot of nice stuff going on at this point, and uh, I'm really feeling more at home here than at any time in my life in Texas, to be very honest with you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is just New York is home. You know, I, I can do things here that I couldn't do in anywhere else in the world yeah well maybe there's a few places but you know um yeah. texas overall you know i was back in austin two years ago recovering from covid and um then uh was able to go ahead and get a teaching job uh back at texas state university where i finished my master's degree huh. and uh, came in there was working with students but we weren't able to really meet until this past fall semester and now we just finished up in the spring at least in person, we did everything on pretty much online. Yeah. Because uh, by the summer of 2020, you know, I'm I'm recovering from COVID and teaching lessons online and working with students. And, and all of a sudden, having to go ahead and get my chops and my teaching chops, you know, in particular, as well as my playing chops back in place. Um, I am very, very fortunate to have recovered as well as I have and am still moving forward. So, yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. congratulations. That's all amazing. I'm really happy yeah, for you. Thanks. Thanks. Well, the show is called Having a Mission. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, it's it's been um, the initiative has always been towards doing the best and being the best I can ever since I was a kid. Once yeah. I found my passion. Well, on that note, so this next I gotta prime this next question a bit. Um please. So when I showed up to high school, this was fall 2003, the older kids there at the school I went to, they had this culture about them. They were kind of tougher than we were. And it was just this general sense of excellence. You know, you're a part of something big that's been built up before you came here and we're going to hold you to that. And even if with those people, even if they weren't particularly gifted at music, they always showed up and strived to be better in whatever they're doing. Sure. And a good chunk of my class responded well to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I turned sophomore year, I saw that the incoming class wasn't responding as well to what remained of that culture that I yeah. mentioned. And I kind of butted heads with a couple of the younger ones who, again, they, they quote unquote, worked hard in a certain sense. They showed up, of course, but when being confronted about the finer points of music or marching, uh, they didn't take it too well. And it was, yeah. that was a point of contention. There was a much more, and I was told by several of the kids and one director that the relax a little bit and have fun kind of, which uh, I'll elaborate on in a second. But for me, striving to do better and accomplish whatever that entail, even if it's just, you know, getting your range better, that was part of the fun for me. Sure. And so I noticed as time went on, the younger classes, there were good players and there were hard workers, but as a whole, that commitment to excellence, even if you weren't quote unquote meant to be a musician in some sense, it was there less and less. And so I've noticed, yeah. I noticed that when I was in high school and then a few years later, I came <laughs> back in tech and it was worse. But sure. I've, 
I've heard with athletes, like some professional athletes, they're talking about, you know, they want kids to have fun, but whenever they talk about how they got to where they were, it was all about, you know, sacrifice, hard work, and not letting yourself slide. So what do you think about this conflict between having fun with something that you enjoy, but also holding yourself to a higher standard, which isn't always easy to do? Yeah, that's, that has been, um, that can be a bit of a challenge at times. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the real thing is it's making sure that this is what you're doing, what you are doing in this sense, to hold yourself to a higher standard and yet having fun at it. It's really your passion. That's the key. Mm-hmm. Is your passion in that general direction? If it is, then it's not it's about holding yourself to a higher standard like everybody else is because you were going to do that anyway because this is what you love to do. Yeah. You know? And if you really love to do it, you're going to always have fun. You're going to find ways to have fun. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's, to me, that's how it's worked. Um, and I understand having, having taught a lot of the, the students past you as well as before you, uh-huh. how, uh, how that can be, um, uh, how those attitudes can change. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, the, the thing is, is that, Part of it comes down to the whole culture and the way it was established by your head director and, and how long that head director was there in place to help to maintain that state. Yeah. Because when it comes from the top and goes through his assistant directors and mm-hmm. then into the, the, the senior class, the leadership of the band going all the way down from the seniors to the juniors to the sophomores, you have this mighty base that you can eventually end up with which yeah. is what happened in the case of where you went to school. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there was a history of excellence that came from the, the particular thing about the music being at that high of a standard because you were going into, uh, and, and, and to, to kind of throw in this as well, uh, it's part of this thing behind the University of Scholastic League in Texas and their focus as well, because there's always this sense of evaluation that happens whether you are actually a student or whether you are a teacher, there's always this level of evaluation that comes down. Mm-hmm. In the case of the of the, the school band programs or the orchestra programs or the choir programs, uh, the fine arts programs throughout the district, regions, and areas of Texas, uh, the UIL had certain rubrics, certain levels that you know you could achieve. Once you went to those levels and achieved them, then you ended up eventually going to what they call state level competitions. Same thing that you went through with member solo and ensemble mm-hmm. and starting off by your freshman year, trying to figure out a solo or what to play and yep. how to interpret it and uh, do this. And you go in and you play it with the uh, help of, of an accompanist and you yeah. have three or four or five band directors on the panel there who are listening to you and they have to give you an evaluation of how well you played it, how well you interpreted it, even though your sense of music might be even higher than theirs, but they're the ones who evaluate. Mm. So... Um, it, to me, it's like having that kind of a, of, a, of, a, of a means of evaluation in place uh, and having directors, some of whom who really shot for excellence with their students and their, their, their bands or their programs over decades, you know, because there's, there's, there's yeah. story programs throughout the state, uh, you know, uh, where you went to high school. There's others now, like, say, for instance, uh, Johnson High School. Oh, yeah which has become a little bit more of the regional powerhouse. There's also Ronald Reagan High School. Yep. Which has always had a kind of a... But, you know, it changes, too, with each head director. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, and and also, yeah, you get these classes of of groups that would come through. I remember talking to a a bunch of friends of mine, teachers, as well, who would say would run in three-year cycles. You would have one year where the students would come in and they'd all just be so receptive and so engaged and so together and so with it. Mm -hmm. And then you have the second year when you would get like a mix of those kids and some of the other kids who were kind of like there to be there and such like that. And then you'd have a third year where you'd have this whole thing cycle turned around where you have a bunch of kids there who were just really not that focused, really not that attentive, really not into it and in a very small group. So it would kind of shift around. And it was that, I heard this from at least a half dozen teachers, a three-year cycle that happened. You were part of a three-year cycle that came around to where you and the other members of your freshman class who came in were on the upper end of that. Mm-hmm. You guys were the, the more of the engaged group that actually uh, took to heart the lessons from previous classes 
yeah. and decided to go ahead and carry it forward, which in your case worked out for you well. You're also making all state uh, all state band mm-hmm. two years in a row. Yeah, you know that was that was a good that, class. <laughs> that was a really good class. No, I re- I remember that class very well. There were a few of them because I also taught over there at that school mm-hmm. for about a good five six year period. Yeah. So, um, but then you know because I had a bunch of kids who came through from there and did really well. Then I had other schools that also would call upon me to come and teach. Oh, and yeah. work. So I worked all over. I mean, San Antonio Independent School District, Southeast, mm-hmm. East Central, uh, <clears throat> North Side ISD, uh, Northeast ISD, uh, Shirt, Cibolo, um, Judson. You know, I mean, I was literally all over the city at, at certain times and averaging around 37 to almost 40,000 miles a year on the car just driving. Oh, wow. Because it's San Antonio and it's all spread out. So literally. Yeah. Literally, yeah. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I would I would go through cars. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but you know, I, uh, I, I saw a lot of great people and I met a lot of great people, not just in terms of students, but also in terms of the families. Mm. Uh, some of whom needed a little help but they were so their kid was so into it and they were so wanting the kid to help out so i would always offer my assistance you know or a discount or even just uh, you know not charge them anything mm-hmm. whereas other students who would come in whose families were a little bit better off and such yeah it's like okay here's my standard rate and such and it's like yeah well yeah. you got the rep so we'll pay it huh. and it was like <laughs> sure and, and i i have that now you know i have students that i see uh, I just got back three weeks ago from tour. I'm doing a tour with this incredible swing dance show called Swing Out. Wow. And um, we were out in L.A. for a week, three weeks ago. Had a blast. Played at the L.A. Music Center over there. And uh, the, the beauty of this show is that there's 12 of the most incredible Lindy Hop dancers and professional dancers from around the world who are involved in this show along with a 10-piece swing dance orchestra led by this really, really great band leader and musician composer, arranger named A.L. Billman, he's an Israeli guy in Tel Aviv, really, really fine writer, has been living in the States for many years, did his undergraduate study um, in Israel at the Conservatory of Music, where they really emphasized jazz, and that jazz study, so he came in knowing a lot more about jazz than some of the cats who were growing up here, and an appreciation for it. He's yeah. become an established band leader in the jazz and swing era now, and just recently released, I think his fourth or fifth album, which I'm playing on at least three of them. But the latest one is called The Jam, and it's a bunch of swing dance tunes, uh, mostly originals that AL wrote for the band, uh, of which we use those songs for this show. So uh, I was out in LA, did some stuff there, got a chance to meet up and talk to some people, and now I also have another guy who's studying with me from out in LA, because he's, you know, the, he knows about me and my level of excellence and what I've done. Yeah, uh, doesn't help. It doesn't hurt also having a new album. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's really helped. Uh, my latest album I released it back in August, and still have yet to have oh. a release party here in uh, New York. But I'm working on it. It's called Trombocalist. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I sing and I sing and play on the album. Uh, ten, out of the ten songs, five of them I'm singing with, and uh, it's it's uh, a few originals and uh, some remixes or rewrites of some standards or jazz mm. classics. And um, I've got this phenomenal group of musicians from here in New York that I was working with who all contributed wonderfully to the album and to the project, to the music making as well as the production, and uh, gave me a break to help me out, you know, by offering their services for less than what they would normally charge because they liked me and believed enough in me and my music and the project. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. That's, uh, and the album is out now. I'm streaming on uh, Apple Music as well as on Spotify. And four of the songs from the album are now on Sirius XM. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to so, take yeah. a look at that. Yeah. Please do. Please do. Tell your friends. Tell the yeah. folks. They'll love it. Yeah. And a quick note is I've, uh, from time to time, looked on YouTube and found you there. And yeah. Yeah. Whether it's a, few things up. a lecture or just something you're putting out there. And I love, going into the comments and seeing everyone blown away about how good it is. And I just get this sense of pride, like that guy was my teacher. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you. I, uh, I, you know, but, but this is the thing with me too, because it's what my parents, my dad, and my mom in particular, and still in me, a level of excellence. You have mm-hmm. to be, you have to be, a, you can't just be as good as the next guy. You have to be better than the next guy, especially growing up as a black kid in Texas, much less mm-hmm. in America. 
So uh, that has been a part of my credo mm-hmm. for, the, for all of my life, just to be as good as, and it's like, it's not just being as good as you can be, it's being the best you can be. Yeah. But now it's like, I understand and appreciate that. And there's still things that I'm improving on because it yeah. doesn't stop. No. But I, I now appreciate and have a lot more fun doing it. Yeah. You know, I mean, like uh, with the Broadway show, for instance, doing Swing Out or playing with a big band or doing my own projects and stuff like that, there's always this level of excitement that comes to me and comes from me because I'm doing these things. Because mm-hmm. this is all still part of me uh, evolving still growing you know after going through so many things physically with covid Mm -hmm. two years ago or before that some over eight years ago with a kidney transplant Mm -hmm. and uh just you know surviving yeah Um, i i have lots of friends and peers who are no longer with us who are at my age who work beforehand so i feel like that i've i've been very 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 to uh to have gotten this far with it I mean, even the even the jazz icons who I who I revere or listen to or studied or transcribed and such, uh, unfortunately, a, a, a good portion of them passed away before they reached fifty. Wow! So in jazz years, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> you know, in human life years right now, I'm doing all right. I'm doing yeah. all right. I mean, you know, I I I, I take regular medication. I take to take mm. good care of myself. Yeah. Uh, get you know get the required amount of sleep as I can, but you know, that's, you know, living the musician's life and the artist's life, sometimes you don't get that much. And then other times you get more than you think. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think the biggest key here, which kind of goes back to your initial statement of your question that you're asking me here, um, between, you know, really giving your best effort and yet finding, having fun and stuff like that. Yeah. That finding balance. Mm-hmm. I think that's the, I think that's the real key behind all this, Daniel. It's finding the balance within yourself to know that if this is something that you really enjoy doing and you have a passion for it, then you're always going to find things that you can do with it to have fun. Yeah. But also realizing that in the process of having fun, you're still improving. You're still constantly growing. You still have this passion to learn, to grow, to nurture. And uh, I, uh, as much as I've been through and as much as life as I've lived at this point, I still have as much of that at times, not more so. Mm-hmm. Just because I, I'm still able to do it. I'm still here. I'm still functional. I'm still very much eating, sleeping, living, breathing, functioning, playing, passionate, loving, caring, uh, angry, pissed off, mad guy who, <laughs> who deals with all these aspects in life and yet still tries to find the joy. In it, which yeah. is why after I finish up with you, I'm going to go practice. Because <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I haven't had a chance to practice that much since I've been doing all the show playing and then all of course the, the, the little bit of touring because I just got back last week. Last week uh, I was back at the show. The week before that I was in Massachusetts. Oh, wow. So uh, doing the same <laughs> swing dance performances with this group Swing Out. Yeah. But this time at uh, this incredible center for dance up in the Northeast here mm-hmm. um, in a little city of Belton, Massachusetts. Uh, it's called Jacob's Pillow. Mm. And it is a, an awesome awesome place for dance to me it reminded me of a combination between interlocking academy of arts and music mm-hmm. uh in michigan and tanglewood which is also a big festival and, and music structured program here that's actually pretty close by you know it's pretty close over there to jacob's pillow yeah so and they have summer classes and performances and workshops and all this stuff during the fall and the spring but the summer they really do a, a lot with dance and work with different dance groups they've been doing it since like 1938 and uh it's pretty awesome so that was the last yeah. thing now i'm pretty much back in place and doing broadway yeah at the end of july and then i've got a couple of other things coming up in august you know maybe take a little downtime go to the beach yeah and uh, because it's it's even though we have a heat wave up here that's about to happen that mm-hmm. heat wave um is going to put us into the lower to mid 90s for the week Mm. But then by next Monday, it's going to be back in the 80s. Again. That's our heat wave up here. Yeah. As compared to down in South <laughs> Texas or throughout Texas as a whole, where we're dealing with 100 degree temperatures. Yep. Again. So mm. uh, I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what uh, you just went over. So sure. uh, I had mentioned, uh, or I don't know if I did, but uh, in high school, there was a director who I never quite <laughs> got along with. 
but I did respect that he held me to a high standard. I, I kind of I, want. I know of who you speak, so <laughs> we'll just go with that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I had heard that because uh, I know some directors locally that they ran into him and the way he runs his program now, it's more laid back and there's more of that element of wanting the kids to have fun. Yeah. And the, the, the part of me that yeah. didn't quite get along, I, I felt that that high standard was the thing about him that I respected the most. And, sure. uh, and trying to put a positive spin on it, I felt that that standard was, again, like I mentioned with you, it went with me. It was good life skills or whatever you want to call it that went with sure. me onward. Sure. And so the, my objection to that or leaning too far into that, again, because I don't know what he's doing, is that that is valuable to kids of, you know, okay, that was pretty good. You can do better. And again, I, I haven't seen him in action, so I don't know exactly how fun it is over there, or, you know, that balance. Uh -huh. It's uh, from what I've heard, it's uh, it, it's he's made it more fun. He's there's still that that focus that was there towards excellence, but now it's like mm. it's been tempered and aged a bit because mm. sometimes in the process of certain people who would teach that way and do it for an extended period of time, the level of stress that can rack on their body can be tremendous. Yeah, and uh, I think that was something that also happened with that course. Okay. A lot of stress that came out from it, and basically, what it comes down to is that you kind of have to you know, step back for a bit and realize that the way mm -hmm. you were doing things before and the way that you would approach things before is not going to be helpful, but more so it becomes detrimental to your own health. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you're always trying to go, 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 bang, 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 then you, know, you will eventually burn. Yeah, so in his case, along with a few other band directors who started off along those same lines that I know of, and mm -hmm. I have a feeling you've seen some more of them. Mm -hmm. they have all gone that same route now where it's like they're a lot more chill they're a lot more like yeah kids you know okay we're just gonna do our best i want you to have a good time because this is making music because it's really all about that yeah and to a point they've learned that lesson and and yeah it should be about making music and having fun mm -hmm. but there also comes that other focus on the other side of it which is the discipline side of it yeah because if you are going to really be good at something or anything that you really have your mind and your heart set on, then you're going to work at it. You're mm -hmm. going to apply yourself to it. You're going to put in the time, the days, the weeks, the months, the years to be able to get really good at that. And I found that with certain musicians here who I consider to be just upper echelon artists. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just that they have the, the Grammy Awards and all of the, the recorded music and all this stuff out there and everything, but mm -hmm. they're still actively involved in the learning and growth of the instrument as well as the teaching and purveying that knowledge, passing on that knowledge. Yeah. Um, those are the legends to me, the icons. You know, you still see, I mean, it's like the recent list of the uh, National Education of the Arts, National Endowment of the Arts, Jazz Masters uh, mm -hmm. list. These are people who have dedicated their lives to not only being as musical as they could, but also achieving very high levels of their own musicality and uh, have been awarded time and time again for their efforts, but also employ a lot of that same focus and the disciplines and now employed with added with passion and some fun to when they do their own teaching, whether it's going to be at the universities or conservatories they teach at or even just like doing summer workshops. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, there's those guys who I find out here who are just like, I consider to be like, you know, um, the, either the elders or the mentors mm -hmm. No, but then there's a whole host of other cats out there who are there to go ahead and they started off that way and they kind of change things around with it because of their own physical issues or, or mentally or even emotionally. Yeah. Uh, and now it's about, you know. Either they still are in the profession or they're not longer in it, but they found something else that they, where they can actually enjoy it. Mm. And that's where they found their passion. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and it takes me back to that original point that I was talking about as well. It's like finding your passion. Yeah. Uh, and to me, still, it's making music. There's, so, there's, there's no greater joy for me than being able to still create and make music and share it with people. Yeah. Yeah. So, kind of piggybacking off of what I just did, but also commenting again about passion. So last December, 
I was doing good with money. And so I rented a euphonium. It wasn't a great one, okay. but uh, I had to be. It's yeah. Not the horn, it's the player. Yeah. I, it was an interesting challenge. So I grabbed, you know, my beginner books and my old warm ups, the ones, you know, the good ones, the best ones. Of course. <laughs> and I. <laughs> Oh, Daniel, I've missed you so. <laughs> yeah. My man, go on, please. And uh, I I couldn't play anything I wanted to, but I know, you know, this is going to be a process. I, I expected that. And there was joy in, you know, getting to play again, like after the first week, let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, getting back on the horse and riding again, you fall a few times. Yeah. Sure. And for those listening, hard music isn't, necessarily better it's just more the, the things that i wanted to play the interesting things required skill that i didn't have at this time yeah. so at that time i could only practice an hour a day back in high school when like you know band was that was the thing i cared about most even more than grades sure. uh, i was doing about three hours a day and so when i was doing an hour a day here um improvement was slow and i turned to youtube and there were there's lots I mean, I'll talk about this later, but technology has, you know, grown a lot. There's lots of stuff out there. And I found some tone exercises and I focused on that. And then every other day would focus on some upper range thing because that was not good at that time. So about four months of working, I mean, honestly, my tone was better than it was in high school. Like you said, it's not, it's not the instrument, it's the player. I had to learn to play sound good on this thing. Mm -hmm. But four months later, I mean... For the most part, every other aspect of my playing was not nearly close to where I was in high school. Sure. And uh, it, it was starting to, when I would pick up the horn to start playing, it almost wasn't fun anymore because, I, I mean, I know I, when I start up, I know I'm not where I want to be and I will practice and get better, that kind of thing. Sure. But months later, it's, I know I picked this up, I'm still going to be inching better on some other aspects and you know tone it's like i was starting to hit diminishing returns yeah. and i kind of had to stop because like every time i picked up the horn it was reminded that i'm not where i wanted to be and i'm not yeah. going to be where i want to be anytime soon and the the, the wake-up call quote unquote was that because i had been working two jobs and i had a week where i had off because i you know worked during the day and then there was like an hour after where i do the other one mm-hmm. i had so i'm like okay i have an extra hour every day but I wasn't feeling the urge to use that hour to keep playing. And so I uh, yeah. turned the horn back in and I thought, you know what, maybe when I have, you know, I can do two hours a day, I'll pick this up again. But sure. I also just got busier with the podcast and other things too. That was a, 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 another factor in it. Yeah. So there was the joy in it, but at the same time, not being able to play at a level because like playing poorly, there, there wasn't joy in that. Yeah. For me. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. I got you. And, you know, it's really funny because when I was recovered from COVID the first time I had, uh, you know, I was in a coma for 32 days, on a ventilator for 37 days. Wow. Yeah. This was back in April 2020. And uh, consequently, it turned into the longest time I was off my horn. <laughs> yeah. In my life uh, before I started really, you know, when I was really playing. Um, uh, it took me probably about a good two and a half to three months before I could get back on the instrument. Wow. And when I did, I, I had to really temper my expectations mm-hmm. a lot compared to the standard that I'm used to. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think the biggest key for me was just that um, I had to kind of be patient with myself Mm -hmm. more so and also just a little bit more um appreciative of the work that i had done to get to the point where i was Mm -hmm. and understanding that if i didn't quite get back to where i was it wasn't going to be the end of the world it would just mean there's a different phase in my life yeah well i'm at the stage now where i'm as good if not better than i was before yeah because I didn't let up as much on myself, I kept my expectations up and high. And and uh, I'm I'm you know it's so funny because now that I'm back and people were watching throughout my social media, 
because um, there was a lot of posts about me going through what I went through. Uh, later on, as I came out of it, doing interviews on various Texas public radio stations, as well as uh, on one interview on CNN, mm. uh, talking wow. about uh, risks of COVID exposure. Uh, mm. This was before we had all the vaccines and such. You know, so yeah. It was just about um, being able to really get my sense of appreciation and gratitude again for what I do. And, uh, you know, I had to go through a little bit of, of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for a couple of months mm. just to kind of get a grasp on everything I went through and how to temper my expectations to understand the importance of what I've done has been really good and what I still do is really good and being able to improve and get a better to them where I was. If that's where I want to be, then yes, that's the best thing. And yeah. you can do that. But, you know, it's just being patient with yourself. Another life lesson that I had come to understand because there were many years where I wasn't as patient or forgiving with myself and would at times tell people other things other than what was really going on. Mm. Just because I didn't want them to look at me any other way than I felt like I should do, have them look at me that way or me look at myself. And, um, you know, I, I came to realize that there were a lot of things that I was doing that were really good. There were other things that I was doing in, in terms of with myself and with my life that, that I just needed to address. And um, recovering from a, a life-threatening illness, uh, there's nothing, dare I say, better to help you to gain a better perspective yeah. than, than something like that, whether it's like, I don't know, uh, COVID now, or cancer, or, or any other disease that will take away, or kill you, or take away your quality of life. Yeah. Um, there's nothing like being able to fully recover from such a traumatic event yeah. and help you to gain better perspective on it. So now to me, it's like when we come about, we're talking about, you know, the discipline and finding your passion, doing what you do best and yet still having fun at it. That what it comes down to is that now I have so much appreciation for doing what I'm doing and, and having done it so well and now back to doing it as well, if not better than before, has now allowed me these unique opportunities of being back in the, the Ben Hole in New York City and doing the jobs I'm doing now, doing the stuff I'm doing now. This is all, I guess, a part of the crazy thing with that we deal with in life. It's finding our way through the things that are good, the things that are bad, the adversities, the successes, the wins, the losses, and still figuring out, are you who you think you are? Are you where are you at? What do you feel? How do you feel? Why do you feel that way? Yeah. And what 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 do you do that makes things can make things better, not just for you, but for the people around you? So yeah. um, you know, um, I I was raised to, to be selfless. Uh, I learned at times how to be selfish, but now I am more so just wanting to just continue to be myself. Mm -hmm. And being myself means making music at the highest levels that I can for the rest of my life, being able to mm. teach it, to being able to record it, to being able to perform it, to being able to uh, allow myself to gain even more opportunities at this stage uh, that will um, help me to keep moving the music forward. Yeah. You know, wow. I mean, it's, it's a bigger legacy than I am, uh, but I'm a part of that legacy. Yeah. You know, in this case, in jazz, uh, or, or if I were to focus more towards or classical repertoire or, you know, what I do with Broadway or what I do uh, with whether I'm playing with a funk band or a, a, a banda group or a folklorico ballet group or whoever. It's, it's I find the passion is, is there and even better than with me because I'm able to still do it. Yeah. I feel very, very fortunate. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Some would say blessed. I was, I would appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I am, uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be able to go ahead and still make this happen. Yeah. And I'm glad to be able to do it at the level I'm doing it because I still work on some really hard stuff. <laughs> I mean, I had a, I had a, one of my best friends from down in San Antonio who was a, just retired as a band director. Her son wrote a concerto for bass trombone and four French horns for him. Oh, that is just phenomenal. He just graduated from SMU and he's now got a, a master's. He's got a 
uh, doing his graduate study starting this fall at UT Austin. And uh, his name's uh, Ethan Gerwitz. His, his, his composition mm -hmm. was, was awarded at the International Trombone Association Festival uh, for one of the best new compositions for the instrument. Because it's, <laughs> it's a very, it's a modern piece where the, I get to go ahead and perform and showcase all of the range and technique and the focus I have on a bass trombone. And then in turn, in a cadenza, I'll be scat singing. You know, doing some jazz and that. It's yeah. a very unique piece because it's pretty much built around the way I play. It's called Concerto for Ron Wilkins. Mm -hmm. So I had to, the thing is, is that <laughs> it's got all this phenomenal stuff in it. And I was talking to Ethan about this a while back when I was doing some recording work on it. And I said, dude, I had to kind of tape it back a little bit of this just because some of this stuff is just crazy hard. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, I can, I, I still feel like I can work certain things up. But you know, this is also part of the working with composers who want yeah. to write music for you. They can, you can collaborate on certain things and ideas. And I was the one who suggested four French horns with a bass trombone doing it as a concerto. Mm. And he was like, okay, you know, because this is also a young man who, when he was, uh, in middle school and high school, he was a four-year All-State French Hornist. Yeah, one of these, another one of these guys. So yeah, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I, I feel like I'm talking with a like mind here who understands that. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but the other thing is, is that he was also one of those kids who I would go ahead and when I had a Broadway show come in, I would have him come and sit in the pit with me and watch it, mm. and watch us play the show. Yeah, I don't know if we ever got to do that, Daniel. Well, again, I played euphonium so yeah but you know uh, the thing is is that with, there are certain broadway shows that require euphonium on them along with trombone tenor and bass trombone and tuba oh even back uh, then in 07 ish yeah 07 ish i mean there oh. are certain shows like um for instance uh this was after you this was probably around 2011 was the second uh, time or so that uh, or 2010 actually that west side story came into town well that book um. for the trombone book had tenor trombone and euphonium in it. oh yeah awesome yeah and uh, and then there's also a, a few others as well, like Chorus Line, would occasionally have some double parts for euphonium. Wow, sweet. <laughs> Most of the time it'd be tenor and bass trombone. Too. This yeah. particular show I'm doing with Funny Girl is just one trombone, but I'm playing six different mutes <laughs> on the show. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 there are a couple of times where I'm literally mute juggling. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've got one in your lap, you've got another one by your foot, and you've got one that's in the bell that you're going to have to take out and then switch out to the other one, and then you're going to have to grab the other one and then do some plunger work off that and put that back yeah. down, and then play through and then keep the other one that you had in your lap earlier back into the horn again. <clears throat> it's kind of nuts. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, but it's this kind of stuff that I just thrive on. Yeah. I really do. And I mean, and I'm hanging out with my peers. Yeah. On shows like this, there are people up here who are some of, some of the greatest musicians that you've never heard of because all they've been doing is playing Broadway shows for the last 15, 20, 30 years. Yeah. It's yeah. like when you, you know, it's like uh, out in LA with the, with the recording studio industry, the way it's been for so many decades, all these great musicians who you've never heard of before who were playing on the soundtracks for different cartoons like Bugs Bunny mm -hmm. or the Fairly Odd Parents now or. Heck, even SpongeBob SquarePants. Not to mention, you know, all the movie soundtracks, Steven Spielberg stuff, like you know, yeah. uh, uh, any of the Indiana Jones series. I mean, all these soundtracks. There's these incredible group of musicians who've been playing on a lot of this stuff that yeah. people do not know them by name, but these are some of the most recognized sounds in the business because yeah. they're the ones playing on the soundtracks. You know. Uh, the trumpet section or the members of the London Symphony Orchestra played on the soundtrack, on the soundtrack for Star Wars. You have the, the brass fanfare where they're going, who are those guys? Yeah. Oh, well, they're, they play with uh, the LA uh, Philharmonic. Oh, they're with the London Symphony, but they're with uh, Berlin, they're with blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, but these are all people who live up to that, certain, that same kind of code of excellence. Mm hmm. It's kind of cool to be a part of that. Uh, kind of cool to be a part of that. Real quick, did you say the 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 guy who wrote the concerto for you was Gerwitz? His name is Ethan Gerwitz. His mother, uh, Emily yeah. Gerwitz, just retired. She was the band director of Bradley Middle School for years. Yeah, her. Uh, uh, she was there. I remember when she got the gig. She was working at the time with uh, Larry Schmidt, who was the head band director there, and another former Air Force band cat friend of mine. And part-time mentor named Ed Kiner. 
Yeah, I I went to school with her students, and mm. I think I remember when Mr. Ethan was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, small. Yeah. Oh yeah, small world. He's not <laughs> so much of a kid anymore now. He's like twenty no, no. years old, but he's just he's yeah. A, he's another one of these extremely talented young men who who you know appreciates and loves his uncle Ron and decided <laughs> to go ahead and write some music for him, especially when I was sick and recovering. And oh, uh, eventually yeah. we're going to record and do video of it because um, I've I've been asked by the International Trombone Association for their festival to go ahead and perform it. Wow. Uh, and um, for for certain reasons that I will not go into, uh, I did not get to actually do any of that, mostly uh, on my own volition. There's uh, certain things there that I'm not yeah. going to try to elaborate on. Okay, so, yeah. But uh, I figured that, and I told Ethan about this as well, um, that I eventually want to go ahead and have him come up here and either perform on one of the horn parts or conduct it, mm. and we can go ahead and do it with some guys up here in New York and really make a big presentation out of it. Maybe who knows? Do it at Carnegie Hall. It could happen. Wow. The guy has the right money, you can rent out of space. Yeah. <laughs> Ron Wilkins performing the Gerwitz Space Trombone Concerto live at Carnegie Hall. Oh, who's Gerwitz? Who's Wilkins? What's a bass trombone? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, um, I have been very fortunate to have a lot of great people in my life that yeah. I know <laughs> who come through. And uh, I, I've, I've had some amazing students. I've had some yeah. really, really amazing students. I've seen you, among so many others, mm -hmm. who have gone on to try to pursue their passions and interests. And uh, it's always a joy for me to be able to re reacquaint. Yeah. And, and say hi again. Same with, like, anytime I see a, a teacher that had a big impact, it's, yeah, just gratitude overflow. Oh, man, absolutely. It's, it's, and I, I, I too feel the love and I also have gratitude for being able to talk, work with you and your sibling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. The, the lovely and talented Mike. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So, so oh, Go ahead, please. I was going to say, on the note of teaching, um, I had a question. So I wasn't a perfect student by any means, but lack mm -hmm. of effort was never an issue, going back to that opening sure. story. Sure. Uh, and uh, hearing what you said earlier, it took a few years, but at that point, you it seemed you expressed that you were going to start limiting the amount of high school students you took because you were at that time doing starting to do other bigger things. Oh, yeah. So my Question was, and then, well, you uh, said here that it was till 2012, mostly when that stopped. My question is, like, what were some of the highs and lows of teaching for, God, that was 11, 12, 23 years? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's still going. The oh, yeah. Highs, the highs are, I think one of the biggest highs I get out of it is when I am conveying a concept, an idea to a student that they may have heard before or mm. gotten insight into but they didn't quite get it, but I was able to tell them to them in a way where they did get it. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, when I saw the recognition come through in their eyes, or as I like to put it, when the light goes on. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're like, oh. <laughs> and then I'm sitting here going, okay, now I got you excited. Yeah. Now here's what we can do with it. Mm -hmm. And and I I um I think that's one of the greatest things when you can convey knowledge and wisdom and insight to a student. And they understand it. Yeah. Once they get it, then it's like, oh. And I and you know, one of the things that I also came to appreciate in my own learnings is that it wasn't just about with one teacher for me. Uh, it was about finding different teachers along the way. Yeah. You know, I still have some that I that I worked with and still remember my first one of my first trombone teachers. Um, uh, Ms. Jane Rossi, who used to play the second trombone in San Symphony. Her husband, Nick, was a principal trombonist with him for decades. Mm -hmm. um, she's still alive down in San Antonio. She came out to one of my performances a few years back when I was back in San Antonio. Yeah. And uh, we had this discussion about when did she see that I died? Mm -hmm. When did she notice that I understood? She said, we always had the talent. It was just getting me to realize how to make it happen. The thing what I think that came to you was that when I showed you, it wasn't just how a symphony orchestra or symphony musicians play, it's the music, how you mm -hmm. make music. That's how I emphasize it with you. It made, it, it made a big impression. Because before that, you just seemed to be like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. 
But it's like when I explain to you about how this music works and how you can make your own music by doing what you're doing. And I'm like, Whoa. so I can do that. So you can do it well. You can do it as well as anybody else out there or better if you want. You know. Yeah. And uh, and I remember lessons like that from her or from others um, who I had as instructors along the way. And I, I was that was one of the things I wanted to try to convey as well with you and the, uh, your fellow peers when you guys were coming through at that time, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the ones before you and the ones after. Even now, when I'm working with guys here who are like, oh man, I, I've heard about you for years. I just wanted to study with you and blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, that's great. You know, let's, let's hang out. Let's show me what you can do. Yeah. You know, and uh, let me, I'll, I will help and assist you as I can in ways of whether it's pedagogically or whether it's just uh, conceptually and approaching the instrument or whether we're looking at musical elements of it, uh, whether it's playing and working on your chops with um, a classical piece that you're working on or an audition or some gigs you got coming up and you just want to play jazz and improvise. Yeah. Uh, or if, you, if you're out here and you're going to do a salsa gig and you want to know how to interpret salsa, you know, uh, one of the things I was doing over the last two years during my recovery uh, in particular, down in Texas, I'm teaching at Texas State University, where I'm also not only teaching the classical students in the studio, but I also had a couple of jazz students that I was working with, along with one student who was studying Latin music studies as a grad student. Mm -hmm. So I got to cover all these bases, and in turn, it helped me to get back to doing my own research on these things and the musicians that play and make the music. Mm -hmm. And it helped me to be able to get even more of the appreciation going when I was trying to get my own chops back in place as well as helping students at the university to be able to not only to, for instance, pass their jury or their grade year mm. exams, or to be able to go ahead and eventually finish their graduate study. Mm -hmm. And I, I had two master's degree students who both have gone on and graduated. One of them who did the Latin, the master's degree in Latin studies, just got an assistant band director job teaching in Austin ISD. The other one who did his master's in jazz studies has got a cruise ship gig now. And he's going to be going out and, and playing. Uh, yeah, awesome. Go, go see the world, man. Yeah. Go see the world. And they both know that whenever they come to visit me in New York, I have a spot for them on the couch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. A, quick, a, a quick caveat on that. So I, the second job I had that I mentioned earlier, I was mm -hmm. teaching web development. And it was an interesting experience of, because I had witnessed this too of learning a concept and it just didn't take or didn't make any sense and then getting different explanations of it and then eventually somewhere along the line something clicks and it makes sense so with students trying to get uh, again going in with the understanding I'm trying to foster their understanding of something yeah. and so sometimes it's like okay think of a way to explain something now think of two different ways of explaining it as well because like metaphors or whatnot and like people like in conversations will like say oh i hate this is an awful metaphor but hey if it articulates what it means then it's not awful yeah it's like if it gets the point across yeah exactly you know, it carries the message and uh, teaching that in that job gave me a much bigger appreciation for when we first met and well not first met mm. but when you took me on as a student you said if you're not trying I won't teach you. I didn't have that luxury. I had to teach, but if sure. they didn't want to, but, and then of course the flashbacks with the directors, when they're like, you guys don't understand how good you are. And here we are. And you're not using what we know you're capable of. I understood that frustration a lot more. Whenever Yeah. It's kind of crazy when it comes back around like that too, isn't it? Yeah. All of a sudden it's like, once again, now the shoe is on the other foot. Yeah. Mr. Cor says. Well, and I mean, now, here you are as the as, as the instructor. I would have bad days, but again, for the most part, I was the like I wanted to do good. So yeah. sure, sure, <laughs> of course, and we all have. I mean, come on, I mean, yeah. No one, no one is immune from any of that stuff. I mean, you know, as long as we all live on planet Earth, we all have our share. Yeah, but uh, you know, this has been cool. I I, I will tell you though, it's it's uh, I need to stop. Okay, I, yeah, we're, understand. We're. Uh, we're nearing that time here, right? I was going to try and get some practice time in. I probably won't be able to get very much. Okay. But more so because I've got neighbors around me. And um, actually, they're pretty cool. But still, uh, I need to go ahead and step away from them. Okay. Well, 
Thank you so much, Ron, for doing this and chatting and sharing everything. Oh, dude, this was, you know, uh, this great pleasure and, yeah. and, a, and an honor. Thank you, Daniel, for the opportunity to be a part of, uh, of your podcast with having initiative. And uh, I, I hope it helps. I mean, even if it just reaches one or two or three people, it gives them a little bit more insight yeah. into uh, how to be able to develop and grow the initiative that they may have to be able to fulfill at least goals, dreams, or at least achieve more than what they thought they could. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I think that's that's really cool that you're doing this. Thank you. So, thank you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you again for listening. So a little bit of trivia, the music that I used to transition from the podcast to the housekeeping section on this episode and others, that is a solo that was made for cello. Ron gave it to me my senior year of high school for a competition. And going back to when I was talking about, I tried to play my instrument again earlier this year, but got frustrated with how I couldn't play at the level I wanted to and wasn't going to be able to anytime soon. That was a piece that I was working on and I got nowhere with it. The opening piece that I use for my podcast, that was one that I got a little bit of success on. So perspective. So with this episode, if you're a musician or if you have just any comments about excellence and a culture of that and loving what you do, even if it's difficult, please let me know. And if you'd like to support the channel, please like, comment on, and share any of the videos and like, or I'm sorry, uh, subscribe and hit that notification bell. It really does help. So thank you again for listening, and I hope to see you next week. Take care.